it's this big. Oh, it says it's live on. Nice. Okay. Hi, friends. <laughs> so glad hey. How do we, once upon a time, uh, we do everything experientially um, and we are learning. So how do we, how do we, how do we, how do we see who, if anybody is watching and where the comments are? I'll tell you if anyone's watching. I have been I'll go. around with Facebook live events from my phone and that gives me immediate feedback. And we're working on integrating uh, the Zoom with the, the book face and um, I'm really excited for this event tonight. Once upon a time last week, uh, me and Lucinda and Kendra were hanging out talking about some ideas and we had a really good one and we wanted to share it with you. So for those of you who don't know, my name is Bryn Ladig and I am one of the Kikori co-founders um, and I am here with my partner, Kendra. Hi guys, my name is Kendra. I'm one of the Kikori co-founders too. <laughs> and our uh, creator of the week that we are featuring is uh, my favorite partner in crime, Lucinda Martinelli. Um, hey, so hey. Tell us a little bit about Whole Planet Consulting and who you are. So I am Lucinda Martinelli. And I'm in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I know you two are in New Hampshire and Wisconsin, so we're kind of spanning the East and Midwest a little bit. Um, so <clears throat> uh, my company is Whole Planet Consulting, and what we do is help schools implement social emotional learning, which is going to be so crucial this fall. Uh, so I'm so excited to talk about the end of the year this year and then talk, start talking about like how that impacts next fall, because um, it does. So I'm excited. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. So um, when we were talking about Kikori, and so for those of you who maybe don't know super intimately, Kikori is a new experiential education app that democratizes access to quality education activities. Um, and we have it on both mobile and desktop. So you can get it on your phones or on your computer. We have a database of over 400 activities and they are all aligned with social emotional learning standards, 21st century skills um, and UNESCO's uh, sustainable development goals. And so what's really important and really passionate to all three of us is that it's not just about those activities, um, but it's about what you do with them and how you use them as a medium to teach social emotional learning. And part of that then is sequencing and Lucinda, Lucinda is our sequencing experts and her and I um, have been hanging out a lot this past semester uh, talking about how we can integrate neuroscience um, as well as learning standards and like uh, different conflict resolution hacks, um, all kinds of things that it's not so much about the activity as it is some of these bigger, broader ideas that get infused within it. And as we approach the end of this absolutely unprecedented, because there's not another word, uh, school year, we wanted to wrap up with you guys and touch base. So if at any point during this live stream, you want to say hi, um, I would love to see who's out there, who's watching, where you are tuning in from, and if you have any questions at all. And even if you're not watching it live, put your questions in the chat and we will respond to them. Um, so Absolutely. How, how did your year go? Were you in person? Were you remote? Were you hybrid? I know um, I've got some friends in Ontario and they're on their third lockdown. So what sort of yo-yo have you guys been on? I mean, Jeffrey, what's it like in Virginia? Um, I talked to a teacher a couple months ago and she said at that point, like in... I want to say like February, March, 
they had been in five different teaching modalities Jeez. at that point. And the, the year wasn't even over yet. So like teachers have been through the mill this year. If it could have been tried, it was tried. <laughs> And some of it worked probably well, and some of it probably didn't work so well. So um, I love that I'm in a position to support teachers through that because goodness knows, my goodness, they need support and they need all of us. So I love that I get to do that. That I work for has been in person since September. So we have been able to stay open this whole time. However, that hasn't been without hiccups. I mean, we have pulled all of our subs and all of our interventionists and we have gotten creative with coverage but we did what we had to do to stay open um and i know that there's other schools and i'm in rural wisconsin and i talked to um, a good friend of mine in kendra's that was in our master's program and they were going back after easter and they were really anxious because they hadn't all been vaccinated yet and they were worried about the exact same things that me and my teachers were worried about back in september so i know that it's been a whole thing but when we look back on this year why why is the end of the year important yeah so the end of things i find when i when i do my teaching is generally with groups that I have for a day. And often at the end of the day, I kind of forget about planning for the end of the day. That's like my weak point, um, but it is really important. So one of the models that I work with a lot is Tuckman's stages of group development. And the, the last stage of a group's development is adjournment. And it's actually pretty important um, and there are some important things that the leader of a group needs to do at that point. Because at that point, there's a lot of emotions going on. Um, people may be excited that the group is breaking up, that the, the, the time is ending, but they also might be really anxious about it. They might be sad about it. They might be really angry about it. Um, and our kids are no exception. I mean, kids are all over the map when it comes to the end of the school year. Um, I know I, when I was teaching the school, I always noticed at the end of the school year, there were some kids, their behavior kind of got off the charts a little bit at the end of the school year because they were anxious about the, the school year ending. Um, they didn't know what was up for the summer and they might have not been going back to a great situation uh, for the summer. So um, they were, they were pretty anxious about that and it showed in their behavior. What, when I learned about Tuckman stages of group development, I never even focused on adjourning because we were worried about the ones in the beginning. Can you go over what the entire cycle looks like? Yeah, sure. So there are five stages of group development. The first stage is forming. And I think this gets a lot of attention, especially by teachers. Uh, teachers are taught how to there's that book, the first six weeks of school, right? And you build your classroom culture and you get your routines down and all that kind of stuff, which is super important. Um, and it's important to do that well, because then the rest of your year tends to go better. Um, the next stage that groups go through is a storming phase. And this is the phase that none of us like. I know that I am really uncomfortable with this phase. It's when there's a lot of conflict it's kind of, I think teachers can kind of pinpoint like November, December, like things start to go a little off the rails, right? Um, and that means that your students are figuring out what their place is in that community and what the, whether the norms you've set up will actually be norms that will stay um, and what their place is and kind of um, how they feel about the group going forward. And it's kind of where they figure out um, what they're going to be like in the group and whether the group can function as a group going forward. So if that goes okay, if you kind of get through that stage and kids are like, okay, I know that I'm going to be supported in this class. I know I'm going to be heard. I know I'm going to be seen. Um, then they can get to a place where they're norming. So this is a place where people are comfortable with the routines. They know what's expected of them. Um, they uh, are comfortable with the, the tasks that they're asked to do. They may have difficult tasks, but they know that they can do those things together. So they're more comfortable. Uh, and then they sometimes get to a place of performing. And this is the place that teachers really love to get their class to and don't always, we don't always get there and that's perfectly okay. 
But you know, when you have that class that you just can give them a project and they run with it and they do great things with it. And you as a teacher have to do less kind of uh, dealing with all the behaviors and you're dealing with actually teaching them things um, because you've got all the routines down, they know it's expected and they're pretty much doing what you expect them to do. So that's that performing stage and that's a stage that we really love. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that end stage is the adjourning stage. And that's when we're looking at the end of the year when you as a class, this group that you've built all year long is going to disband. It's going to be, it's not going to be a group after whatever day is the end of school. Um, and it's going to be a new something going forward. So um, like I said, there's a lot of emotions that go with that. Um, and it's important to, to work through those. I always had the hardest time like leaving summer camp. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, you know, I was, yeah, I always end up staying an extra two weeks <laughs> like when I was knowing that the, the end of a trip was coming, Kendra and I went on a backpacking trip during our master's program and it was sort of like an out and a loop and then a back. And like the last day and a half, I was like dragging my feet. I like, didn't want to go home and everybody else is like horses to the barn. Like, let's go, let's get it over with. <laughs> out wilderness like give me a shower and I'm like uh you know and I feel like that's how a lot of sometimes our students are right like some of them mm -hmm. are like oh my gosh I am over the structure I am done with having my lunch at this time every day and having to do the worksheets and having to sit in this thing and I just want my summer to start and others are like oh my gosh my summer is so chaotic. I need my space, my place, yep. my schedule, my routine. My friends. Yes. For so me, summer was really hard because if I made friends during school, I moved around a lot. So it took a long time for me to make friends. And when I left for the summer, I never saw those friends. I didn't live in a place usually where I could have easy access to those people. So I didn't see friends over the summer. Usually um, I would go to camp and I would go on vacation with my family, which was great. And I looked forward to, but um, yeah, I was really without my friends. So it was really a mixed bag for me. So, I mean, we've talked about what those, those stages are and why this adjourning stage is really important. Um, how there can be a whole bunch of different feelings and emotions and anxieties that go along with it. But thinking about it from a COVID perspective, how do we mm -hmm. ensure that our, our staff, our coworkers, our students look back on it in a good way or in the most positive way instead of like, spiraling around that toilet bowl of misery and <laughs> right. and you know like like every year I feel like the last week of December people say oh this year was such a dumpster fire like how do we how do we reframe things and what do we know about reframing things that can help both ourselves and our students remember the best parts of the year yeah, well, and I think just what, you know, what we talked about when we first started thinking about this is what an awesome opportunity we have. And in, you know, learning about kinesthetic metaphors, um, how the past, like the experience happened, you know, this is one of my big learnings over this past year is this thing may have happened, but through reframing, through reflection, through taking time and thinking about what we learned, how strong we got, you know, what we gained from this, we can actually change the way that we remember something. So yes, what happened may be frozen in time, but there's this crazy opportunity to take this thing and come out the other end with, you know, a whole new perspective on life potentially, if you, you know, if you take the time to do that. And so, yeah, so I think that's what is so exciting about this the space and time and these activities that we're going to share tonight. Yeah. So if you think about yourself as not just a teacher, but an educational facilitator, that you're going to facilitate this opportunity. Um, and what we know about memory is that we don't continually draw back from that raw footage of the original event. 
So what happens with our memories is that we keep remembering the last time we remembered it. So we have this very unique opportunity called neuroplasticity. And you guys, there is a really cool thing about our adolescents that their brains are the most malleable that they have been since they were a toddler. And I need you to tell them. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. It's because it gives them this, it arms them with this knowledge that it doesn't have to be just what happened to them. But so adolescent brains are the most neural plastic they have been since they were a toddler. And so if you re-remember things, you can redefine that neural pathway. And I think about it as like digging a path in the sand. And if you get that trench really deep, it's hard for the water to flow outside of it. But the deeper we dig, the more solidified that path is. And so that's, that's what we get to do by practicing gratitude, by reframing it in a positive light. Um, and there's this thing called the peak and end rule. And the peak and end rule says that we remember the peak experience and the end. And so that peak can be the best part or the worst part, but we always remember the end. And so how do we, what is our charge as educators, as facilitators? How do we use that to our advantage to help make sure that our and students, our students um, are, are, are prepared for the summer and to come back in the fall ready to learn with good memories of this year. Um, yeah, so even if this last year was, like you said, that dumpster fire, which, you know, let's face it, <laughs> sometimes it was this last year, but if we can leave our students with uh, some positive, feelings about each other, some positive feelings about school, some positive feelings about this is a place where I belong. Like even if the rest of the year has not been like that, if the last like two couple weeks of school is, um, that can be really powerful to how they feel about coming back to school in the fall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we put together a playlist and if you're not aware, a playlist is much like you would get on a music, you could build on a music streaming app, but it's an order of activities that are available on the Kikori app that you do in order of that sequence to maximize um, the group learning outcomes. So if you don't have the app already, I would love for you to go and get it. Um, it's available on the App Store and in Google Play, Kikori, K-I-K-O-R-I -K app. Um, it's this pretty, pretty purple heart, um, purple heart K with the gradient. Um, and when you open it, it brings you to this activity page. Um, but we were talking about this, the three of us, and we built this playlist and we want to share these activities that you can run the end of the school year to maximize some social emotional learning outcomes to reframe in a positive light um, and end the year on a high note. And I know a lot of schools are doing field trips or movies. And I know that you as educators are done. Like you don't <laughs> want another thing. And so we're trying to offer this to you with minimal prep um, right at your fingertips. We've done the hard thinking. Um, and these activities should, should really uh, improve the way that you end the year with uh, your programs. So yeah, I'm a big fan of no prep activities. Like mm -hmm. just have, you know, a bunch of kids and an idea and there you go. <laughs> Sometimes that's all you need. Maybe a little piece of paper or something. I love that. So the first one that we put on our playlist is called morphing and it's also known as evolution. And um, it's one of my very favorite games to play. Uh, it can be done sort of as a competition, but it has this really great twist that um, I learned from my friend Drew Barr. And so it's a rock, paper, scissors game. And how everybody starts is you sort of go over the general rules of rock, paper, scissors. So rock, paper, scissors, show. Rock, paper, scissors, throw. Uh, rock, paper, scissors, go. 
And um, I just want to note that we've taken out the word shoot because there are some areas where that is a trigger for some folks. So um, just changing our language a little bit makes it a little more inclusive and it doesn't, doesn't take away from the activity. So everybody, I make them practice rock, paper, scissors. Um, and we, that or we go one, two, three, throw. And so we do our one, two, three, throw. It's not one, two, throw. It's not one, two, three, four, because when they pair off, it's not best two out of three. It's not the best five out of seven. They get one chance. If there's a tie, then there's a do-over, but we're not messing around here. This is cutthroat. So everybody starts as an egg and they hunch up with their knees or <laughs> they scrunch up and they find another egg and they waddle over to the other egg and they play rock, paper, scissors. Okay, ready? If you lose, yeah. Rock, rock paper, paper, scissors, go. Go. I win. I'm still an egg. So Kendra stays an egg. I become a chicken. So then I find another chicken. So Lucinda, it looks like you're a chicken. Oh, I'm a chicken. So I egg, can play I rock, egg, paper, scissors, other egg. A chicken. I cannot play with an egg. So eggs can only play with eggs chickens only with chickens. So then Lucinda and I play rock, paper, scissors. Okay. Let's say I win. Okay. I, you won. Hey, you won. I, I'm still a chicken. Oh, I'm Brinosaur. I can only play rock, paper, scissors with other Brinosaurs or dinosaurs. And um, beyond that, then here is where this gets debatable. And you as a facilitator can make this your own. I make my kids be Beyonce. Yes, Kendra. I want to. I want to share my version at the end too. Okay, so after there's egg, there's chicken, there's dinosaur, then there's Beyonce. So one hand on your hip, and then you're flipping your hand. And this is starting to get a little bit dated, but oh my gosh, does it make me laugh and it entertains me? <laughs> and really, that's the most important thing is I well, want to make that I am having fun while I'm facilitating and watching a bunch of middle school boys pretend to be Beyonce and <laughs> so well, but it's important to know why it's Beyonce because Beyonce is the ultimate being so yeah. this is the, the the goal is to become the ultimate being and Beyonce is the ultimate being and so that's why it's her and well and then after that you become a superhero and you hold oh. your superhero pose and you just stand off to the side. And there's some really great TED Talks about the power of, of holding a power pose. And I recommend you look that up and make your participants and your students do that also. But for this one, you hold your power pose. Once a superhero, always a superhero. And what's gonna happen is your participants are gonna, they're gonna move up and down the ladder and it's gonna be dynamic and it's gonna be crazy. And the way that you can do this during COVID times is just encourage them to stay apart, wear masks if that makes sense for you in your practice, but there's no touching in this game. Um, and so you can do it outside, you can do it in a gym. Um, so whatever COVID protocols make sense for you. And about halfway through this activity, there's gonna be a bunch of people that are really frustrated that they are still an egg. And there's gonna be a bunch of people who are super bored and their arm is gonna get sore holding this pose. And you read the energy of the group. So don't let it go too long. The trick is to get in there right before it starts to die down. And you charge them with like, you say you have, you have 10 seconds left and you start counting down or you give them some sort of time limit that ups the ante, but then you tell them that the goal of the activity is to get everyone to superhero status. Everyone to superhero status. So they'll start playing with more fervor. And then you can ask them, what do superheroes do? What do superheroes do? They save people. They save they help people. They save people. They help. They, they save help. animals, they save people, yeah. they make things better, they care. But if the goal is to get everybody to superhero status, how? How do you get everybody to superhero status? But once a superhero, always a superhero. Do superheroes get to play another 
Well, once a superhero, always a superhero. So what's the so what's the harm? Right. So they could play other other people and they would never not be a superhero. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love that. So the That's goal my favorite version. That <laughs> I love that. Is to get the superheroes to understand that they have the power to help the rest of their peers. The debrief can be, you know. How did it feel when you won? How did it feel when you lost? Were you ever frustrated in this activity? How often do you feel that there are other aspects of your life where you move forward, but then you move back? How many of you tried to lose rock, paper, scissors on purpose? How, how hard was it to lose on purpose? How did you know how to help your friends? You know, and so how, what did that nonverbal communication look like between you and your peers? Um, all kinds of really great debriefing opportunities there. Yes, Kendra. Ray Segundo Jr. Abrea is joining us from the Philippines and he shared his, the way that he plays this, which is egg, chicken, yeah. eagle, oh. Power Ranger, Power Puff. <laughs> Superman, yes. Wonder Woman, and then the final would be Elite Team oh. of the organization, institution, school. And what he said is that his favorite debriefing is on not quitting. The failing mm -hmm. is okay, oh. failing forward, taking risks, and that we're all here for each other in the end of the day. I because who wants to be a superhero by themselves? That's boring. Right. Right. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> and um. integrity. I love yeah. that. You know, I love- What are your, um, for your versions? Yeah, so I was gonna say that um, my playlist started with something different. I didn't start with morphing. Um, I started with something called Letters with Friends and it's actually a name game, which seems like kind of a weird thing to do at the end of the year. But I started with that because so often I work with groups all throughout the year and I work with different groups all the time. When I work with groups in May and June, I'm shocked that there is often at least one student in the class that people don't know their names. They've been that quiet kid or that kid all year, or they were new to the class at some point and they didn't go through all those name things that you do at the beginning of the year. They kind of got left out of that or they have a name that people have never been quite sure how to pronounce. And so they just don't. Um, so I always, I like to start with the name game, even in May or June, even in the last couple of weeks of school, because names are super, super important. It's hard to really feel seen or heard without knowing, without people knowing your name and being able to pronounce it right. So that's where I started was names. And so the letters with friends is, uh, kind of a mingle, you're mingling around and just greeting people by name. Hi, I'm Lucinda. Mm. And you'd say, hi, I'm Bryn. And then you call out a letter and then people have to work together to make that letter. So you call out three, B. And so three people have to work together to make the letter B. Um, so that's kind of an in-person thing. It can be distanced. It's a little harder to do distanced um, to make the letters, um, but you could adapt it in a number of different ways. Um, and then the next thing I had in my sequence was emotion charades. How do you because there are so many different emotions at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. um, emotion charades. So um, often if, when I first introduce this activity, I often have uh, a whole bunch of uh, things already made. Like I have cards that already have the emotions on them. Mm -hmm. And we kind of, you know, divide them up. And it's a lesson in just knowing what these emotions are and how, how difficult it is to tell what emotions people are having and that kind of thing. But at the end of the year, what I would do is have those things out and have the students choose the emotion that they are feeling at the time to put in the pile. So the, the ones that you have to play with are the ones that the students have chosen that they have. And so then they, you split them into two teams and they choose a card and they choose an emotion and one person has to act it out and the rest of the team has to try and figure out what it is. Just like regular charades. Um, do you want to play? <laughs> yes. Okay. 
always want to play. So I've never done this virtually. I was, I played with, I was in a group that was playing, but I've never uh, facilitated this virtually. So this will be an experiment. So this will be fun. So in the chat, um, just type emotions that you think might be in a classroom at the end of the year. Okay, I'll read Whatever them off. can think of. Okay. And then at the end of this, we're gonna show you one extra special variation we learned in our master's school program. Oh my gosh. Oh, fun. Can we ask the Facebook Live audience for Ooh. a moment? This yes. is oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Give us, what emotions do you think are gonna crop up at the end of the year? Oh my gosh, okay, and Fernanda is de Chile. Fernanda, si te puedes escribir unos emociones que te sientes en el fin del año en el chat. You guys, can you please share some emotions that you're feeling right now in the chat? Yeah. Pretty please. <laughs> and we're going to put some in too. Let's see. Yeah. Scared, excited. Uh, let's see. So I think already we have some really positive ones and some kind of maybe less pleasant ones for us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Fernanda said love. Oh, oh, Mache said remembrance. Añoranza. Oh. Hey, love would be amor. We've got sad, excited. Uh, Bray Segundo said this emotion charade should be interesting to try. Giving everyone the chance to speak out their emotions, turning your feelings into actions. This reminds me of my adventure therapy, of course. Excited, <laughs> happiness, nervous. All right. So does Excited one of about us summer. Want something out and the other two guess? Yes. Or so who would like to do the acting out and who would like to guess? Okay. I'm going to act out an emotion. Or Kendra, do you want to? Okay. You guys won't get it. <laughs> it's too hard. <laughs> <laughs> that's not mine okay so i'm just writing that in one from, from, from the list go Bryn. well i was gonna do one oh that oh because that makes sense if you've seen it already Ooh, uh, jessica versus, ramos morales put tense thrilled oh i like these oh they're putting actually emotions out like nice excited oh wait okay do it again surprise <gasps> terrified scared scared oh scared uh, i got it <laughs> right so okay can i have great, great um yeah yeah do yours yeah do yours okay mine isn't listed in there you just oh. have to guess it okay, okay. that's harder <sighs> relieved yes oh <laughs> which was it overwhelmed <laughs> no relief Oh, really? Okay. Okay. Relieved. Yes, that's how I'm going to feel in four days when I finish my, <laughs> when I finish my school year. Oh, these are so right? cute. I think, I think that's going to be an overwhelming teacher emotion is mm -hmm. relieved, um, relieved that the end of the school year is here. Uh, but it's, it's so interesting. So to talk about this with students, it's so interesting to see what emotions were in that list. So there's a lot of them and there's a really wide variety. Mm -hmm. And so how might that come out in the classroom? How might we see these things? So like, it's not always easy to tell what emotions people have by what they do. Mm. Um, our actions are tied to our emotions, but some of them, like when you were giving us scared, um, we were guessing like excited or surprised. So it's not always easy to tell if somebody is feeling a certain way. So that's a really great debrief. And then to talk about like, Okay, so we have a lot of emotions going on at the end of the year, just to acknowledge that and just so that that kid who feels like they're the only one who feels that way, when they see that that card is in the pile and maybe more than one person put that card in the pile, maybe there's more than one of those. Um, so they see that they're not alone and that's a really huge thing. Well, and there's also a lot of power in labeling. So um, I know that yeah. their emotions came out but we talk um, where I work at Camp Manitowish about how, how to regulate your brain. And so like um, when you flip your lid, part of, part of getting back that control or helping yourself regulate, um, Lucinda and I do some stuff on Dr. Perry's brain science, but a way to help regulate yourself is to label, to just 
label the feeling yeah. um, to give it a name. Just to name it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, all good. Yeah, that can be really huge. Yeah, sometimes kids with strong emotions are really frightened by that because mm -hmm. um, they just, they think it's, they, it has a power to it and they're just not sure they can control it. And it's really can, can be kind of frightening. So yeah, just naming it and saying, this is an emotion and all emotions are, are allowed here. All emotions are welcome. Great. What's yeah. the activity on your playlist? We both picked the same one to go next in the middle of our playlist. We picked Toolkit. Yay. Yay. Yeah. So yeah. this was an activity that I actually got to play. Um, I took part in an adventure therapy course. It was one of my last ever courses in my life. And it was also one of the best. Um, and it was really cool because the last activity that we played Toolkit was very similar to one of the first activities I played 10 years ago when I started this. And it was played in two different ways. And so the way that I first played um, was with Jen Stanchfield. I still remember we were at Loyola University at a workshop and she had an entire table covered with all of these different tools. And we had to choose a tool that represented, um, I think this was an opener, but represented you know, something that really resonated with us. And so, and then during this last one, we had to draw, so we had to get into a group of four and we had to draw a tool that represented something, a tool that we were taking with us at the end of the course. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I like to do this kind of in conjunction with, um, some people do a social contract at the beginning of the year. Um, some people do something called the being. Mm -hmm. um, and it's good to revisit that at the end of the year. And look at your social contract and look at the things that you, hopefully you've used it as a living document the whole year long. And so you've revisited it before. And so you look back at that and say, look at all the things we were able to do together. We were able to build a classroom that had all of these things to it. What were the tools we used to be able to do that with each other? What were the tools we used to build a classroom that was kind? a classroom that was inclusive, a classroom that like all the things we said we wanted our classroom to be, um, what were the tools we used to do that? And so you can use that same kind of uh, metaphor to talk about your specific class and like, how did it go? And what did you do well? Um, what were the tools we you used to get there? Um, especially this year, I think it's really important to focus on like the, the things that you use that help to do something positive. Because it's just so easy to focus on the negative, like we already talked about. Um, but I mean, if we've gone through something negative, we've learned some things, like right. So we've learned how to deal with some things that are not so great, uh, and so those are our tools. And so it's important to to acknowledge those. And so I mean, if if you already have a full value contract of some kind, I love that revisiting it, um, and. If you don't have one documented, perhaps you can bring it, bring it in as a debrief and say, hey guys, what did we do this whole last year that we agreed to that worked? And then sort of just debrief yeah. based on something that, that you guys may have unconsciously done. And um, if you need ideas, we have a whole- Oh, there's so many on there. Of <laughs> of ideas on Kikori. So these are all different ways to build a value contract. Um, and, then, and then you can discuss them and hopefully find a way either drawing or by providing an example of things that they can choose from, maybe touch and sanitize. I love the idea of drawing or even just imagining so that there's a tactile relation with a tool. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and attitudes and behaviors that helped as a tool. So the tool doesn't have to be something else. Um, and, and try and pull in your school or your organization's language. Um, build off of those things that they're gonna hear from their, their teacher next year. Mm -hmm. um, every yeah. tool 
tends to have, you know, their words and their common language. Um, so bring it in and talk about it and then let your students have that familiarity to carry forward into the next year. I'd say, especially if you have students going like from elementary to middle school, mm -hmm. from middle school to high school, you might not always know exactly what those are that they're going to. But even if they have some things they, they can kind of take as a package deal from their school that they're in now to use later and, you know, say, okay, in my old school, we talked about it like this, this these were the words we used. Mm -hmm. um, but those would apply to what they're going to do next. And that's an important thing to realize too. Um, but if you know, like if all your students are going to kind of, you know, the next step and they're kind of all going to the same place, mostly, um, yeah, it's great to bring in those, that language. Um, yeah. So we've talked about, you know, energizers and ways to open things up, different ways to sort of reframe and debrief that talks about naming the emotions. What are the best ways to sort of wrap this all up? Ooh, I'd love me some good warm fuzzies. <laughs> That's a good way to wrap things up always. So warm fuzzies are a great way. When I was in camp, gosh, when I went to camp, when I was in like middle school, I won't tell you what decade it was because it will date me so much, but we would have little warm fuzzies and you can, you can make them out of uh, yarn. You can just wrap a lot of yarn, tie it really tight together. And it's just like a little yarn ball. Those were our warm fuzzies. Um, but there's also an activity that you can do that involves giving each other warm fuzzies, um, warm fuzzy feelings by giving each other appreciations. Mm -hmm. um, and this is really nice to do if you have a class that already has a high level of trust, if you have a class that does not have a high level of trust, I would not recommend doing this activity um, anonymously because if somebody gets a fuzzy that's not so warm, that's prickly, that will also stay with them for a really long time. So, but what this means is that you have uh, pieces of paper. I've seen people sit in a circle and have everyone write their name at the top of a paper and then pass it to the person to their right. And so then each paper gets passed all the way around the circle and everyone writes something about that person, uh, something that they appreciate, some kind of uh, point in the year when this person helped them, something this person is really good at. Uh, and there's some really good prompts in this activity in Kikori. Um, and you can use some of the, um, when you talk about your social contract, you can also bring that, those, that language in. Um, how did this person help our class do whatever it is the class did? Um, that's a really great prompt as well. Um, the other way I've seen people do it is that every person writes their name at the top of their paper and then it gets taped to their back. Mm. And then you walk around the room and everyone gets to write on the back of the person. Um, and then you have that paper to, to have for a long time. Or um, I, I could see that with t-shirts also. Yeah. It's actually oh, yeah. Find everyone in your class, just a, a plain white or, you know, the color of your classroom color t-shirt or something like that. Yeah. Um, and I would say too, it's really great to give kids specific prompts because I know I did this when I was in probably fifth grade or something. And mine just, everyone said I was nice. Which, you know, being nice is really nice, but it just felt like it was not, like something more specific would have been much better to, for me to take home. Um, so encouraging your kids to be specific. And I mean, it's also a writing activity. Shh, don't tell them that, but it is. <laughs> they, if you've talked about like descriptors or like all of those things that you've talked about in your adjectives. English and language arts, adjectives, ELA um, standards. This, like, this, <laughs> yep, exactly. Bring those ELA things in, but you don't have to tell them. It's a fun thing to do. And everyone comes out with a real, a, something that they remember from that class mm -hmm. that is really sweet and really lovely. Yeah. I know that I have gotten messages written in my yearbook 
anonymously, like when it just got passed around. And that seeing those changed how I felt about either maybe that person, if they did sign it or that year, not, not knowing mm -hmm. that a certain behavior of mine affected somebody the way that it did. And so that changes the way you think about it, remember it, the way you feel about it. And that's exactly what we're trying to do here. So these types of activities, they build empathy for one another. They um, allow us to practice gratitude and appreciation. And we know all of those things release chemicals in our brains that help us remember the positive, that help boost that growth mindset and the positive outlook. So all things we need, you know, more practice on this year, probably than, than ever before. Um, so I love all of these ideas. The way that you can play this warm fuzzies virtually is if everybody in the Zoom room changes their name to someone. And it's too bad because we're not uh, live streaming our chat, but, and I don't think that we can, we can do it. Uh, we can ask our, our Facebook audience to anonymously um, put warm fuzzies into the chat because that's just not how Facebook works. But if you can see my little box, I am now someone. And if everyone changes their name to someone, then what the chat would read is someone thinks that Kendra has the biggest heart and the most bottomless optimism they've ever seen. And that someone thinks that Lucinda is incredibly talented and full of knowledge and appreciates the passion that they share uh, with their the world and their facilitation skills. Um, and so someone can say a lot of really nice things and someone uh, doesn't know who someone is always, so. Cool. And I love that anonymous version, but I'd also like to invite, you know, anyone who is in the comments in this video, feel free to tag, you know, a teacher that you've been working with this year or a coworker or a student, if you've got students on your Facebook and share with them a warm fuzzy um, because I think that anywhere that you put it, it's, it's meaningful. It's, it makes a difference. If yeah. you know a teacher, if you know a teacher <laughs> this use year, it right now. <laughs> send them some warm fuzzies, especially right now at the end of the year, they're mm -hmm. exhausted. They've been through the mill. Um, if they've done something for you now this year, five years ago, sometime in the past, um, send them a warm fuzzy. Um, it really, really makes a difference. I still have thank you notes that kids wrote me 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And every time I open up those notes, I still remember those kids. I have thank you notes from the first group of kids I ever taught. Um, and I still remember those kids. They were a hoot. Um, and I only taught them for a week. Uh, and I still remember them. They wrote me little thank you notes and it, it's so sweet and it's so lovely. So like if your kid has benefited from a teacher at all this year in any way, please send that teacher a warm fuzzy. Um, they will so appreciate it. And it really can make a difference in their life um, and in their career. It can really give them a boost. Um, I wanted to give a little shout out to a couple of um creators that have put together physical and virtual tools that also help for end of the year activities. Um, Amy Clymer has Clymer cards, which are amazing. They are super memorable from a number of the different um, workshops that I've done. She also has virtual Clymer cards. So I'm going to add those into the comments. And then I also want to shout out Jen Stanchfield. Again, she's got um, metaphor, um, the, the postcards, which are amazing. Um, and so, yeah, those are a couple other links that we're going to share, which are just, oh gosh, she's got the cute little charm metaphors also. So yes, yeah, they're little minis, little miniatures. I love those because they're so cute. Um, we also just 
as we wrap up sort of our playlist um, idea, please log on and see what there is. Throw your ideas in the chat of the activities that you run with your programs um, that make a difference at the end of the year in closing. I wanna highlight um, Letter to Self um, is an activity that Jen Stanchfield often um, not only writes about, but then like provides that experience for her program participants. Um, and she will safeguard the postcards and the letters and she will mail them to you at, uh, at time. But there's a website called futureme.org and you can write a, an email to your future self. This is really great for virtual programming and for accessibility because there are some folks that may not be at the same physical address year after year. Um, and they, for whatever reason, um, this this isn't accessible to them, or you lose track of it, um, you move, you, or they don't know how to address an envelope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> A you lot of people answer, even because who does that? Yep. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> who does that anymore? And so, yeah, that one's a great idea, but uh, we we really want to hear more about the activities. Um, and Ooh. if you have creative, innovative activities, reach out to us and put them on Kikori, and then you can share them with the world. You can appify your activity and then share it out and be a featured content creator, just like Lucinda and Whole Planet Consulting. Uh, yeah, we so invite you I, into this collaborative space. <laughs> yeah, please do, because I, so I am a creator on Kikori. I don't usually create activities. I create playlists. I use other people as, uh, other people's activities. Um, and teachers, teachers, you know that we do this. You're a great teacher if you know where to find the best stuff. And Kikori has the best stuff. And so when you put from, your best from stuff the on best there, creators, <laughs> from the best creators, that's right. And so it makes all of us better together. Um, so yeah, if you have some great activities, throw them up there because I want them. <laughs> I will use and, them and I will give you credit. That's the other thing is that we know where it came from and we can tell people where it came from. So that's the other thing I love about Kikori is we are tracking down the sources of some of these things, which is really great. Yes. Tara Filippo is another person where a lot of the activities and the blog that we put together also came from Tara Filippo's activities. So shout out yeah. To and if you were at Tara Filippo's um, social emotional learning and action uh, workshop this afternoon. I would love for you to leave in the comments what your favorite activity was or uh, your favorite moment from that workshop because that was great. Um, and yeah. This is so much fun. Yeah, there are a couple of fun comments. So Mache so, shared that. Teacher Institute, I want Lucinda oh, yeah. to share about as well. Mache shared. Yeah, let me hear the comments first. Yes, for her closing, the didactic postgraduate class, they had a thank you board and shared something they learned from you, exchanges among their peers. Um, Bray Segundo said that he loves the tiny charms. They're so portable. Mm -hmm. And he start, he should, and he should start putting up his modified activities. He doesn't usually make new challenges. He just modifies activities or debriefs. And yes, we would absolutely love to share yep. the ways that you're updating activities. Yes, great. I do that too. Um, one of the things that uh, I've started doing is just um, finding variations. So I'll take somebody else's activity. And I'm like, oh, this is a great variation to that. And sometimes I'll put that up there and we're working on ways to, to um, put those together because I want to give credit to the person that whose variation, you know, whose activity it was that I'm doing the variation off of. Um, so yeah, I love to do that too. Um, so yeah, this summer, I am doing a teacher institute. So we are going to get down and dirty into the nitty gritty of applying SEL and integrating it with academic classes and academic activities. So teachers have the skills, you have the skills to do SEL and sometimes they just don't realize that the same techniques that you use in the academic classroom can be used to do social emotional learning things. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take a look at uh, academic um, uh, strategies and techniques, um, things like modeling in science, things like literature, literature circles, um, things like um, group work in math, 
a lot of those things can be, I don't want to say flipped, but they can be adapted and you can use them for social emotional things. And it just rolls right into your curriculum and it's pretty seamless and it doesn't, you don't have to learn a whole bunch of new stuff. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to do it the last week of July and the first week of August, Tuesdays and Thursdays at nine in the morning, just for two hours on Zoom. And then there's a couple little activities in between videos to watch and some reflections to do in between. Doesn't take very long. Um, and I'll be applying for um, sketchies in Michigan. Our CEUs are called sketchies. And so there will be eight of those, seven and a half, seven, somewhere in there, <laughs> some of those. Um, so the, it will be worth sketchies as well. Um, there's information on my website, wholeplanetconsulting.com. Um, and yeah, so join me for that. That'll be super fun. And we'll learn from each other. So that's the other thing is when you get educators all in one room, we learn so much from each other. So that's the other point of doing it together. Yeah. And Kikori will be sharing out about this because I cannot think of a better way to get continuing ed credits than by hanging out with Lucinda. So, um, Wow, thanks. And, and yeah, I'm so excited for that to happen for you. Um, well, in close. Is it, if, uh, if this was fun, if you liked this that yeah. we just did, it's going to be a lot like this. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of yes. like sharing activities and then talking about, well, why do we do this? And why do we do it in this way? Why do we do it in this order? And all that kind of thing. Um, and we get to just pl play a fun, a lot of fun things. So. Yeah. And, and then instead of taking your PDF with you and losing it, you got the activities in Kikori in, Absolutely. The app, in your pocket. So that way you can share the activities. You can add them on in that, you know, half hour that you're, where you're supposed to like put stuff down or you can do it together while you're at the cafe or at the bar after, after the Institute. So <laughs> nice. my final shameless plug is if you or your organization <laughs> want a bulk membership for Kikori, reach out to me directly. Um, I'm enrolling for summer and fall uh, group memberships. And so that is Bryn, B-R-Y-N at kikoriapp.com. Otherwise we will put this information out. But in closing, I just want to say that you have such a powerful opportunity here. And if COVID has taught taught us, showed us anything. It's that teachers are resilient, they are resourceful, and, and you guys are, you're doing it. And, and not to be this toxic op optimism, but it's that we see you and we hear you. And there's a fine line between toxic optimism. And I'm sure that there are some of you that can share stories about that, either from administration or school board or society or parents um, when you're not feeling seen or heard. But as a leader, I want you to know that you have the opportunity to help your peers and your students reframe their experience and remember the very best parts of this last year. And please, if you need to be vulnerable, as we all do, come lean on us. Lean hard on Kikori and Whole Planet Consulting and other people in the field so that you can be that good leader. Um, come and tell us like what, what's not working and what is hard. And we would love to be able to help lighten that load for you because I mean, teachers are making this world go round. I mean, we have been the glue that has held it together when everything has sort of fallen apart around us. So I appreciate you. I love you. I'm so glad that you joined us either live or on the recording this evening. And I look forward to hearing more from you soon. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Love you guys. And thank you, Lucinda working together with us. Thanks, you too. It's great to hang out with you. Mm -hmm. Bye guys. <laughs> I'm hitting the I'm hitting the button. Good.